Google requests for 500 billion naira to cushion subsidy removal impact. This is Top Politics. I am Mary Anderson. With five weeks left from the eight weeks the federal government had an organized labor agreed to the conclusion of subsidy removal talks and palliatives, President Bola Tinubu yesterday asked the House of Representatives to amend the 2022 Supplementary Appropriation Act to allow the federal government source for 500 billion naira for palliative to cushion the effect of petrol subsidy removal. The president, in a letter addressed to the speaker, Tajudina Bass, which was read during Wednesday's plenary, said the money would be sourced from the 2022 Supplementary Appropriation Act of 819.5 billion naira. Now, joining us to discuss this is Shagun Shopetong. He is a public affairs analyst. Also joining us is George Ashiru. He's the chairman of the ADC in Lagos. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. And good evening. Thank you very much, Maria. Yeah. Good evening. All right. Uh, all right. I'm going to start with you, uh, Mr. Shiro. The Senate also has recently okayed um, the um, borrowing of $800 million. Um, even when the last borrowing, according to um, the the last government that left, that we had so many borrowings, $800 million, $200 million, that the former Attorney General and the Finance Minister the former finance minister are yet to account for and now we're having this new attempt to borrow in fact the senate has okayed it that means uh, it's good to go nigerians are wondering why are we borrowing yet again if the other monies that were still for the cushioning effects or the palliative as we call it for the you know subsidy removal um, why do we still have to borrow again um you know, just to be very straightforward with you, this is just politics. Already, the government is saving about 400 billion every month since subsidy was uh, at the end of February. This government is saving. So that is a win for which you know, that was approved or something to have taken effect until your life. So this government will have earned the same amount of money they are trying to borrow just by saving on subsidy. So even though it was approved uh, by the previous governments, uh, this um, this 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 operation extension, it does not mean you have to draw down, especially since we are spending a lot of money. Uh, all of the the income of government is now basically paid for debt. You know, it's not like uh, there's a problem in the size of our debt. The problem is that we're not earning enough to pay for it. We're not a productive economy. We are a trading economy. We rely too much on foreign products. So we are not exporting enough to earn enough to be able to pay off our debt. So the size of our economy is used as justification for borrowing. But the size of our actual net income is not sufficient to pay off our debt. So, and even if you're going to take this, this debt, uh, this borrowing, uh, in order to, 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 to create a palliative for, for the masses, you don't send them pitas, not enough to make a, to make a pot of soup for a family of five. And you are planning to give that to 60 million people through 12 families. And this amount, uh, you know, there are some things, I call some things common sense politics or common sense economics. This does not make any sense to anybody who is discerning. Um, if you make education cheaper, that's a proper palliative. If you make healthcare cheaper, that's a proper palliative. If you create public services that people use on a daily basis, that's a proper palliative. You have taken, you have increased 30% of their monthly costs transportation, the generator, that they are now paying for, you know, they're paying for more, more fuel to be able to power their generators. Factories are going to pay more, you know, to be able to run. Transport is going to go up. So essentially, people are already going to be feeling a massive weight, uh, you know, of, of this subsidy removal, which everybody agrees is sensible. 
What we're saying is this, plan for it, prepare for it, and create a pathway that it can have a positive impact to the people. That's my immediate thought at the moment. I don't think that 500 billion is going to be used in a way that will benefit the people. We have seen from past, uh, past, past uh, activities or previous governments that giving people cash is not the way to jumpstart the economy when we are facing unnecessary inflation because of the policy of the same government. Mm. Shaka, let me come to you. In, in, in 2012, under the Good Luck Jonathan administration, um, when subsidy removal was first and foremost brought to the fore, where we saw the likes of uh, former President Mohamed Buhari and the rest of them go on that march um, called Occupy Nigeria. Um, to, to the credit of the Jonathan administration, the, they gave us details as to how this was going to work if they eventually were going to remove the fuel subsidy. We have details. They were made public down to the T. But then in, in this case, under the Tinubu administration, the whole idea of the subsidy removal and the palliative system and whatever seems to be shrouded in secrecy. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, Miriam, I think there's a lot about um, this conversation that is wrong. Um, the secrecy that we that you refer to, I, I, I'm not sure it's as much secrecy as it's um, about uh, a lack of a coherent plan. I think that's what you're seeing. Um, I think what we're seeing play out is um, uh, a situation where uh, something has been said for a long time um, it has come to be accepted as something that has to happen or something that is the truth. And a president who has just come on board, who is new, you know, in office, feels that um, it's an opportunity. He's, the fact that he's new in office is an opportunity to do something about it while he's, he has goodwill. In fact, if you like, maybe it might even be that he's trying to use this subject to um, derive some goodwill from the right quarters, from the right stakeholders. I think what we have seen is what I think is, a, is basically a knee-jerk, poorly planned policy action. Uh, um, the, 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 the subsidy issue is a very profound issue. It's not something that you trifle with lightly. If you want to talk about subsidies and talk about whether or not they are they, they should be removed, whether or if they're removed, what will happen? You have to go through a very thorough, rigorous um, planning process. You have to put a lot of thought into it. You have to look at what has been done in other parts of the world. How has it worked? What are other countries doing? I do not see any evidence that any of this has happened in with enough detail to, 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 for us to have the desired outcomes. So I don't think what you're seeing is secrecy. I think what you're seeing is the government simply playing it by air, responding as we go along, putting in policies as we go along that they feel will address the concerns that are being raised by the stakeholders. I think that's what we're seeing. And that's why you see, for example, that the first thing that was said was that there was a loan from the World Bank. And then after you've had a loan from the World Bank, then you're now talking about... Um, um, an appropriation of 500 billion naira. Mind you that this appropriation is not a fresh appropriation. It is basically seeking the approval of the National Assembly to convert, at least that's what I saw in the news, to convert an approval that had been given previously uh, by the same National Assembly to the Gwari administration uh, for an 897 billion naira um, uh, um, infrastructure intervention fund to deal with the outcome of uh, the, the problems uh, resulting from flooding and insecurity at that time, late last year. What we're seeing now is the president now asking the National Assembly to approve for, for his administration to use part of that money for something else. So again, you, you can see that perhaps enough thought has not gone into this. To talk about palliatives, like uh, my brother has said, you know, you can't be talking about distribution of cash to people, especially the cash in the amount that we have heard. And if you have to do that, then you've got to ask yourself, why was the subsidy removed in the first place? If the reason for subsidy removal was that there is corruption in the system and that only a few people as a result of the corruption was benefiting from this, 
how come we're replacing this with conditional cash transfers that is pretty much almost impossible to, to track and prevent corruption from derailing? It, it makes it, it doesn't make sense. So, I, you know, it looks as if the government is simply going along and, you know, just playing it along as by air as, as they go. And, you know, it, it's simply not good enough. Mm. Let, let's talk about, um, you know, accountability, because we can't keep talking about these loans and we don't talk about these monies, how we track the monies and follow it and, and who's going to give accounts, for, you know, for these monies. Uh, back, back to you, uh, Mr. Shiru. Um we see, like I said at the beginning, Malami was at some point uh, asked to show up at the National Assembly with the former finance minister to give account about certain monies. And there's several other monies that have been borrowed um, to spend as opposed to borrow to build infrastructure or put into businesses that would bring cloud back profit. How do we get these people to be accountable, whether it's a previous government or the governments before them? Let, let me even quickly chip in that Sarah um, has recently uh, gotten a ruling from the courts that has said um, that the Jonathan or Bassanjo, the Yaradwa government needs to give account of all the monies that they got um, in, in, uh, under the nomenclature of the um, Abacha loot. They need to give account. How do we get these people to give account right now? Because where we are, we're in a tight situation between the devil and the deep blue sea. And Nigerians have continuously, I remember, under the Jonathan administration, we were told to tighten our belts. Do we still have a waist, um, you know, to even put the belts around? Mr. Shiro. Thank you, madam. I think the devil in the blue service is never uh, been accountable. The public service has never governments uh, in power have never seen themselves as being accountable or wanting to be accountable. If you go right back to the days when uh, supposedly for $12 billion, we spent $12 billion uh, to prosecute the war in Sierra Leone and Liberia, um, the Ecomog Fund, we never got a breakdown as to where that money came from and what was useful. So the, the various governments generally have raised money through different sources and never been accountable. And so we have a history, the history of just not being accountable. And, um, and, and this, is, this requires uh, public service reforms. Uh, Freedom of Information Act that we talk about is not actually um, being used except you go to the courts. And even when you go to the courts, uh, we know selectively that government will obey one order or the other or various courts. So it is a problem. It is one of the pillars of injustice in the country. It's one of the reasons why um, corruption, you know, continues to thrive. But what I would like to say is, you know, just quickly going back to the issue of um, uh, subsidy, is that the reason subsidy became necessary was because of, you know, exchange rate issues in the first place. You know, the, the moment our, we were devaluate, devaluing our, our currency, the landing cost of fuel, you know, obviously because it's sold, the dollars keeps going up. Now you have just removed sub, uh, uh, subsidy, and then the cost of getting the dollar to buy the oil has just gone up because you've floated the forex. So everything is just going around in circles. So this is in itself its own accountability. The fact that you can't even link up the two economic factors so that we can all have a debate and say no. You know, you're going to do one before the other, one after the other. You just put everything, knowing that 60% of the population of Nigeria, they are living under what is a worldwide scale of poverty. And so in, 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 in economic terms, uh, we have a problem. And then the lack of accountability of government before it even announces policy is a big problem, not to speak of accountability after it begins to implement those policies. So that's a conversation we need to have as well. Mm. Cheryl, you belong to uh, an accountability network of sorts where you're supposed to push for good governance. And part of good governance is making sure that we have open budgets, that we have governments that are accountable at all levels. And when we talk about accountability, we're always mostly pointing at the federal government. Now, in this case of subsidy, yes, Sony uh, rests on the table of the federal government. But the how to is what we're trying to get at now. And you obviously work with social, um, civil society. How do you think that we can get these people to be accountable? Because you see, most people will say that when you, once a government leaves, it's very difficult 
uh, to track and trace, um, especially monies that have not been accounted for. But might you have an idea as to how Nigerians can go about this? Aside from Sarah, who's been going um, you know, to court every single day and pushing for accountability, how else can we go about this, Shegun? Well, first of all, I can't, I can't praise Serap enough. I think that they're doing an amazing job. Um, um, they're, they're carrying the weight and the load of the entire civil society space at the moment with regards to providing some sort of um, checks and balances for the government, even if at the end of the day, um, we all know that the government tends to um, implement uh, um, uh, court orders, you know, uh, court judgments uh, selectively. Uh, but at least somebody is standing up and saying, you know, come on, give us an account. We at Act Network have done this a couple of times in the past. You know, we've done, we've done freedom of information uh, requests to the Federal Ministry of Agriculture. We've done to the Federal Ministry of Transportation. Um, and we've, we've received responses in varying measures. But what we find is that to a very large extent, governments ignore you. Uh, when you demand accountability uh, because they know that nothing will happen. Um, so, mm. you know, we keep talking about the culture of impunity in this country. Uh, and I think uh. that this, this is perhaps, you know, the root cause of all of this. We, we as a society need to find a way to ensure that there are consequences for bad behavior. So when you make a demand of a government agency or the federal government or a state government, as the case may be, um, that they know that if they do not respond to your demand, that there will be a consequence. Now, what kind of consequences could we possibly have? Yes, you could go to court, but since the, the, the likelihood is that there is no um, uh, mechanism in place to compel them to obey court orders, the only um, thing that I can think of at the moment that could serve as an accountability um, system for government are the elections. So, so you know that at the end of the day, if you do not um, uh, meet the expectations of your citizens and of your electorate and of your voters uh, with regards to the uh, accountability and you, 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 you being transparent with how you use the resources they've entrusted to you, that you will be voted out at the next election. Marianne, you and I know where we stand with regards to that system and how mm. that system has continued to fail. Um, in hmm. terms of providing a mechanism. Because, because I was about to ask, I was about to ask you that, you know, <laughs> in the interim, because especially for this government, they just got in. Um, yeah. So what do we do in the interim while we wait for another, you know, election cycle, which again, many have queried um, because they don't necessarily think that we've been able to have anything close to a free, fair, credible election. So what do we yes. do in the interim? So, so in the intervening period, I think we, we sometimes underestimate the power that we have as citizens, Marianne. I honestly, I honestly believe that Nigerians don't realize how powerful we are, that when we unite behind a cause, that we will have our way, that the politicians are low-key, right? They are low-key afraid of the citizens. They recognize mm -hmm. that the citizens do have power and they do everything in their, in their own power to ensure that the citizens are unable to wield and utilize that power by, you know, um, um, uh, pro, uh, ensuring that education is, 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 uh, um, is crippled, by ensuring that poverty is, um, is weaponized, you know, and all of that. The politicians do all of these things because they know that the moment those things are taken out of the way, then citizens can make demands. I have several examples of situations in the past five years where just using the tool of social media, Nigerians have risen and united in their voice against a particular action or plan of a government, and the government has had no choice but to stand down. This has happened repeatedly, so I can give you examples. The Ruga Initiative, if you remember Ruga about four or five years ago, uh, the social media bill that was being proposed at some point, you know, the ban on Twitter, you know, even though Buhari as stubborn as he was as a president, eventually he bowed to pressure. I don't know, that's, that's, that's out, in the, out there. But the point is, when Nigerians unite a, behind a cause and we speak repeatedly and consistently about that cause, um, 
the government doesn't have a choice. They would have to listen. So beyond the elections, I think we need to ensure that we do not get tired of speaking. We do not get tired of speaking on whatever platforms we have access to. It doesn't matter. You don't have to have access to, you know, TV stations like some of us do and maybe radio stations. Just use your Facebook, use your Twitter, use, use whatever social media platform you have and tweet. You know, the world has changed today and the information is, is flowing freely um, up and vertically and horizontally in society. So, you know, I think it's mm -hmm. important that people need to know that they do have a voice and they should use it. Uh, Mr. Shiri, let me come to you. Uh, just picking up from where Shegun has stopped, the power of the office of the citizen of the Federal Republic is something that we say with a lot of power, but just as he said, we probably do not know how much power that office wields. But he said all the fine and dandy things about how these, this office or the power that we have can be influential. But let's also cast our minds back to the NSAS campaign. And we saw how it ended and, and how people were hurt in the, you know, the, the, the eye of the whole world. The whole world was watching when soldiers, you know, came to attack these unarmed protesters. Now, many people will say, oh, we saw what happened in Occupy Nigeria. That was one successful. But could it also be that this these protests in Nigeria only succeed if it has a political face, if a politician is leading it, if it's to the interest of whether it be the opposition or the sitting government, that is the only time these protests work. Of course, our, our, our constitution allows for us to protest because we are supposed to be in a democracy. But why does it seem that when Nigerians band together, just as Shegun said, they're scared of it, but then half the time, we're attacked. Well, I mean, protests uh, have, have, have always been part of our culture. Uh, anybody who uh, went to university in the and it was this incessant protest against him that actually made it easy for uh, the coupies to attempt to remove it from office. So, uh, you know, we had, a, we had quite a lot of powerful civil society activities in the military era. So what has happened is that after Oshoman left the NLC, suddenly, um, as, you know, the, the civil society um, as, in, as a whole became gentlemanly and felt they could negotiate and discuss with politicians in power rather than take the, the old known road if you are consistent uh, and and, and uh, you don't get tired in making an issue on the front burner, it has an impact on politics. But people get tired. They try once and then after that, they get tired. They try a second time, they get tired. But if we go back to the old culture where, you know, active opposition was on the streets, the days when Ganifa were in the days when Odisa Bakuba and so on and so forth, didn't get tired of coming out every six months. Uh, what led to Yaradua, I mean, to let you good luck, Jonathan be pronounced president of this country when he's, uh, he's at that time the president was ill. And the so-called doctrine of necessity, it was because some people went out to the streets and they were aggressive about it. So if there are policies that we do not agree and there's accountability issue, we have to go back to that old worn out way to get people to continuously look at the issue. But once we do it once and we step back, they will step back. Politicians will use the opportunity to quickly reach out to the leaders of these protest groups and, you know, begin to give them appointments or, you know, whatever it is that they do. So I think that culture is what we need to bring back. The culture of taking an issue, uh, taking a stand on that issue, not necessarily led by politicians, because that makes it even worse, because it is easy for people to now say, if a politician is leading a protest, it is because he's using it as a form of campaign. What it requires is good citizens of this country, patriotic individuals in this nation, across different sectors and strictest of societies, coming out and saying, look, we don't agree with this policy. We don't agree with this type of government. We want to change. We want something new. And it doesn't always have to be violent. As a matter of fact, I don't subscribe to any form of violent protest. But peaceful protests, look at the Black Lives Matter protest. It was worldwide. And it made a difference. It brought justice in the case of the gentleman that was killed unjustly. And I think it shows that Humans by nature, we, we, we don't like being cheated. We would always want to go out there. The moment we know that the people leading those protests have a right agenda and the right motives, we will, be, we will sustain it. So that culture needs to come in. But 
if you look at what my, my uh, governorship candidate in NDC uh, has done of recent, Funsha Doherty, he has been writing, he has been doing a one-man uh, uh, opposition to the policies of government in Lagos State and the Federal. He has been writing to the Lagos State consistently, disagree with lots of policies, disagree with the PPP uh, agenda concerning buses and transportation. And it was it has forced the Lagos State government to respond. They have been forced to call him to meetings at the State Assembly. They have be, they been forced to respond to him you know, with letters because it is sustained. And I think that's what we need to do more of. We, we, we don't get tired from just one attempt. We have to be consistent. We have to be dogged. And we have to be led by people that have integrity and they have right motives. All right, gentlemen, we're going to continue this conversation right after this break because we're going to move on to talk about the Tinubu administration and its trajectory and what this whole subsidy removal means for Nigerians going forward. Stay tuned. It's still Plus Politics. We'll be right back after this break. It's still Plus Politics, and I'm still being joined by... Um, Mr. Shiru, he is the chairman of the ADC in Lagos, uh, Big Dashiru. Also, I'm being joined by Chef Shopita. He is a political analyst and also of Act Network. Now, um, before we went on the break, I was talking to um, Mr. George Ashiru, I beg your pardon. Um, but with, um, Chef, let me come to you. you. You mentioned while we were having this conversation of the culture of impunity that is one of also the bait of corruption in this country the fact that anybody who in fact everybody has made one way or the other politics in nigeria look like a a national cake of sorts where well when i get there no matter how much i wax lyrical during my um, my my uh, campaigns i want to go there get my own share of the national cake and get going and knowing that Several other people have done this and then they've gotten away with it, either with a slap on the wrist or, you know, after a media trial, everything goes cold. Um, no matter how interesting the plans of any president or any administration is, if the culture of impunity continues to, you know, run within the corridors of these powers or alliances that they have due to, um, you know, whether party affiliations or whatever, can we really ever see or experience good governance, especially at a time like this where Nigeria is almost on its knees? Shego. It's it's a very fundamental question you've asked, and I'm and I'm glad because at the end of the day, we, we need to recognize we as a people, when I say we, I mean Nigerians, need to recognize that um, a lot of the things that we're seeing today, this the the flip-flop nature of the implementation of this policy by a government that is just 40 days old, who you would have thought, having just won an election, knowing fully well uh, the effective um, March, I think it was March 6th or thereabouts, that INEC declared the results, knowing fully well that May 29th, three months later, they would be um, in, in, in control in government. You know, one would have thought they would, they, would, they, would, they would have, you know, they would have, you would see more coherence. Right, that the only way to get this government to do the things that we need them to do um, is active engagement by Nigerians in the governance process. There is no other way. There is no mm -hmm. shortcut. If you go to any society that works anywhere in the world, be it the United States, be it the United Kingdom, be it anywhere in the EU, you know, Germany, France, you find that the citizens have an opinion about everything and their voices are heard and they're loud. Mm -hmm. Look at what's happened in France just in, in the last couple of weeks. One boy was shot and the people felt that this was unjust, was because he was an immigrant and all of that and the whole country shut down. You know, we need to get to that point where as, as a people, we recognize that nobody is going to deliver good governance to us on a platter of gold. The same way that the president, the incumbent president, said during the elections that power is not given a la carte and that you have to grab it, you've got to run with it, you've got to... I can't remember those words that he used, you know, the mm. horrific word. That Those same words just replace power in that charge from the president, the current president, 
and replaced it with governance, good governance. Good governance will not fight for it. We've got to struggle for it. We've got to run away with it. Until we do that, we will not get governments that do the things that we need them to do now. How do we do this? I know the conversation always comes down to the how. You know, we're 200 and something million people, um, a majority of whom are impoverished. Um, less than 2 to 3% of these people can be said to be really comfortable. The rest, you know, maybe 10% are probably in the middle class. Everybody else is poor. So your business running around trying to survive, how do you engage? How do you make your voice heard? Well, you've got to, because the reason you are poor is because you are not speaking. So it's a chicken or the egg thing. So whatever voice you have, you have to use it. So tag, look, people are listening. Every single one of these political um, um, uh, office holders, especially the elected ones, they have social media managers. They have special mm. advisors who have been appointed you know, the, the president just appointed Didi Olushegun. You know, that's his Twitter handle. He's been on Twitter for a long time. We follow each other. You know, we've, we've been engaging over the years. He is the special advisor on social media, on new media now. So whatever you are tweeting, tag him. He's going yeah. to see it and he's going to relate some of that to the president. We need to keep speaking, Marianne. There is no other way. There is no shortcut. I'm sorry, but that's, that's just how it works. That's how mm -hmm. the other... Um, um, uh, societies go to where they are today that we admire them and that's what we have to do we've got to keep speaking there's no other way mm. um mr george Ashiri, let me come back to you uh let's talk about the trajectory of the tunable administration Bef when we were on the break i was just trying to paint a picture now that they have said to us that this is our this is the situation they've taken out subsidy even though the question still lingers you took out subsidy because you wanted to put an end to corruption, to plug the loopholes. But now we're seeing another idea of gas being bounced around. And many have many um, pundits have proposed that, look, these are the same guys who have been principalities in the oil and gas sector coming up with another idea with which they're going to strangle this administration and, of course, the people with. So... With the things that we've seen this government do in the forty plus days that it's that you know it has ascended to power, can we really say that they're on the right track, or are we being a bit too judgmental too early? The the truth of the matter is that the 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 economy of a nation and the the as you said the principalities they cannot be dislodged, you know, just by wishful thinking. They can be dislodged by presidential acts. They can be dislodged by decrees. It's going to take a period of studying the system and coming up with alternatives that can neutralize the existing you know, platforms. For example, um, the moment we introduced BVN, you know, we shut down some areas of you know, some loops in the way money is being transferred. You know, when the government came up with single treasury account system, they reduced a certain light, a certain level of uh, corruption within the um, within the monetary system in the federal government of Nigeria, asking everybody to go through a payment platform for paying of goods and services online, reduces. So these are the activities that the government does: reform, reform, reform. And when you focus on reforms, you automatically diffuse all of these various strongholds. But if you are focusing on targeting individuals and targeting groups and targeting blocks, you are fighting unnecessary political battles and you forget the people. What is what is tantamount to good progress in any nation is reforms. Reform the civil service, reform the way and reform education system, reform the health system, reform the oil and gas, you know, uh, apparatus, you reform the financial system. You know, you remember that uh, Soludo, when he was central bank governor, he forced four or five banks to come together. That's what we began to see. Some banks were weak and some banks were strong, you know. So reform the aviation sector. Since reforms came to the aviation sector, we don't hear of air, uh, aircraft crashes like before. So these things are, are common sense politics that you can do as a president, as a governor, as members of National Assembly, rather than just sit down there holding on to the simplest and easiest ways to govern, which is, oh, let's remove subsidy so that we have more money to play around with. What are you going to do with the money? As long as yeah. those strong goals are there. 
As long as those same principalities are there, the same amount of money will still round trip to these same individuals. And in another four years, when you finally leave office, people are poorer. And then you will say, but I did my best. You didn't do your best. You were simply unprepared to govern. You were simply, you misunderstood. I said this message once, you know, immediately after the election. I said, governing the states and governing the federal government, they are two different things. It's a, it's a whole, whole mighty, massive mountain to run the federal government. And that is why succeeding presidents have failed. It has been difficult for them to succeed because they go in there with this naivety, this idea that mm. when I go there, I will, you know, presidential fiat, I'll do this and people will follow. If people in the same civil service to sabotage your policy, they will not implement what is implementable. And then so these are the reasons why the only way is a president can succeed is by listening to the people. You don't talk mm. down to the people. You don't come up with policies and push it down our necks. You, I would have expected that President Tinubu will, will, will take a month and a half to two months to listen to all the arguments concerning, uh, you know, subsidy removal and policies that can go with it, economic policies that can comfort with the savings, and then make pronouncements, make speeches, presidential addresses, everybody along. Everybody feels yes. So what, even if we're suffering, we know the purpose. If there's a denial of something, we know where it's going to come out from. So if you don't give me money here, but I can see that I'm spending less money on, 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 on electricity or I'm spending less money on, on, uh, on my health care, then what you took from me here, you gave it to me there. That's equanimity. That's, that's equity. That's perfect. But if you take from here, you take from there, you take from there, and then you want to reduce corruption. Where? People who are hungry are going to steal. People who don't have a going to crime. You will not spend more money on you know, managing crime. You spend more money... You know, it, I, I keep saying it. These things are common sense. You don't need an economist to sit down to let you know that every time people suffer, you increase the chances of secure insecurity, you increase murder, you increase killing, you increase crime, and you will not have to spend more money on crime. So the money you save there, you spend it there. So as far as yeah. I'm concerned, what this government can do is to be a listening government, is to be a government that listens and communicates with people. And, and, and gets feedback from people and make policies based on that conversation. Not just, this is what we have decided, if you like, go and riot, if you like, go and strike. <laughs> people, the fact that they are not speaking now doesn't mean that when the time is right, they will not come and express their displeasure. And it may not always be through the ballot box. And that's one thing we have mm -hmm. to prevent. Miriam. Yeah. Um, Mr. Shopito, let me come to you now and um, look at this issue of um, young Nigerians, just like um, Mr. Shiro has said, there seems to be some quiet, you know, and a lot of people, some are grumbling quietly, uh, some, are, some are not even saying anything, and many have accused us Nigerians as always just, you know, uh, taking everything that politicians give us. We just roll over. Um, but then Mr. George Shiro has said something that maybe at some point there might be a breaking point. But for a person who, if you were to advise the Tinubu administration, again, looking at the trajectory here and how things are going, um, what would you be advising? Mr. Shira said, listen to the people. Um, I'm, I'm guessing because I remember when the last time you and I had a conversation, you said, oh, that the Tinubu, uh, the man Tinubu himself has worked with technocrats, people who have bright ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're yet to see the people who will, of course, become his um, commissioners uh, and special advisors. Um, but, but right now, there has to be a kitchen cabinet. There are people who are supposed to be advising him. Do you think that they are doing the job pretty well? Um, well, I, I think it's tempting to just say it's too early. But I, I, I honestly don't think it's too early. I think that um, there, is a, there is a proverb um, in Yoruba, and I think it's a common proverb in most cultures. You know the evening from the morning. It's the, the morning tells the evening. And, and um, um, the way that I've seen this government flail, that's the only word I can use. They, they're flailing around with policies. Um, there, there is a lot of incoherence uh, with regards to fiscal policy, tax administration, the made a pronouncement and then they reversed it, you know, and all of that. And, and then the subsidy thing, you know, you're taking subsidy out with, with a wave of a hand 
Um, and then, at, you know, weeks later, you're talking about palliatives that will cost you possibly as much as, if not more, than what you were spending on those subsidies. Um, I don't know who's advising the president. I suspect that he has good advisors because I know some of these guys, you know, some of them I know personally. Some of them, you, mm -hmm. you know them from, from the public, from their public person and the public face. And um, a, mm. a number of them are, they're intelligent. You listen to them speak, you, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not dumb people. They're not dull. They're well-educated and all of that. Yeah. And yet these things are happening. It, it will suggest to me that perhaps the president is not listening to people. You know, the President Tinubu, if you've lived in Lagos for long enough, you know his personality. Um, yeah, he, he could be very, um, he grandstands a lot, right? So I don't know. I, I'm mm. not sure it's, it's the quality of advice as much as what he is intending to do. Um, so mm. my my charge to the president is to be careful um, and not to mistake the silence that we have now. It might very well be the calm before the storm. I suspect that what's happening, mm. people are waiting for the ruling of the court. And so be, between now and that time, um, I would have suggested that the president behaves in a more um, attentive manner, listens to the people and show that okay. he's listening and reacting positively to what they're saying. Otherwise, people will react. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you, gentlemen. This has been a very interesting conversation. Shekman Shopitan is of the ACT Network and, of course, um, George Ashir is the chairman of the ADC here in Lagos. State. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for uh, having this conversation with us. We appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, that's the show tonight. We want to thank you all for being part of the program. Don't forget, you can play catch up on our YouTube to watch our subsequent episodes on Plus Politics. Just go to Plus TV Africa or Plus TV Africa Lifestyle and subscribe. My name is Mary Anna Kun. I'll see you next week as we continue to talk for development. Have a good evening.